<clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Jim Mellon with AFTO. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. We would like to welcome everybody to our webinar on the emerging topic of products made from cell cultured proteins. I know for most, most of us that have been in regulatory for years, this is a new area and I hopefully the, the uh, webinar this afternoon will uh, shed some light on this new area. Uh, we hope that you find this pre the presentations informative and raise your awareness on this new topic in food safety and regulation of uh, that the issues that are facing for regulation of this new um, area of, of foods. Today we have two excellent speakers, uh, Susan Burns and Dr. Barbara uh, Kowalczyk. Um, first up, uh, we would like to uh, have uh, Susan Burns um, talk with us. Susan uh, of Susan Burns LLC is a business lawyer who guides businesses that are pursuing either steady or rapid growth strategies. She holds an LLM in food and agricultural law from the University of Arkansas and uses her expertise to help food companies structure themselves to succeed in business to business or business to consumer environments. This includes supporting growth in innovative, organic, and sustainable food arena for acquisition. Susan is a frequent speaker on regu regulations of cell cultured proteins and serves in leadership roles in the American Bar Association section of International Hall. At this point in time, I'd like to turn it over to Susan. So, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for that nice introduction. <laughs> and uh, I'm really excited to be here today talking with you about this fascinating topic of cell cultured proteins. When I was working on my legal master's in food and ag law, I was a legal fellow for the Good Food Institute, and I don't know if you know of them, but they are the nonprofit organizational uh, nonprofit organization that uh, uh, sort of promotes the the cell cultured protein, alternative proteins, if you will. So that's how I got involved in this topic, and it is it is pretty interesting to me, having just come from my whole animal butcher shop this morning, um, this, is a, this is a topic that's just, it's here to stay and it's pretty interesting. I'm gonna first give you a, an overview of, whoops, I gotta get control of my mouse here at first. Huh. Um, it, so I'm gonna give you guys a headache flicking these slides here. I wanted to give a, a, a like an overview of the regulatory framework, which I think everybody in the audience has a good idea about. So I'm not going to go into detail on that, and then give you an, a little idea about the process, and then talk to you about the history of where we are with the, with the regulation, like what happened and how where are we now with the federal regulation of of these products. So as you know, the job is to regulate food to ensure quality and safety. Um, and the USDA typically regulates meat and FDA regulates food. So the question is like what what are what is this new stuff? And are the existing regs adequate to cover these and other new technologies? Where do the lab proteins fit in. Hmm. I'm having a little trouble here. Okay. I'm just giving you a tease here. Huh. So the first question was what to call it. Is it there was a big argument about that. Cellular agriculture, lab protein, clean meat, fake meat, cultured meat. Cattlemen's Association says, no, this is not meat. The industry says, yes, of course it's meat. It comes from cells from animals. It's meat. 
the, then the question was, if it's meat, well, if it's meat, doesn't the USDA have jurisdiction, which it probably does, or legally does? Um, so what what is is it actually? Um, I don't know. Somebody's Jim or Barbara. Do you want to mute yourselves while you're not talking? Because there's a thumping that I keep hearing in the line here. Um, yes. So anyway, what is it? What it? What is cell cultured protein? It's agricultural products that are produced from cell cultures. They're taken from, they're the same cells that produce meat in an animal. So they take those cells, and Barbara can give you more detail on this process uh, than I can, and she will, I think. Um, using meat, poultry, and fish cells, producing an edible protein that is outside of the animal. And the idea is the finished product will replicate the characteristics of food from food producing animals, you're going to have a meat product, but it doesn't require animal slaughter. So the definition is production of cell types present in meat, muscle cells, fat cells, connective tissue through a cell culture platform and using cells derived from the relevant species. So we have poultry, uh, cattle, pigs, sheep, and uh, fish products. Those are all in the process of being uh, lab created. So the, the, how actually does this process work? First, they take cell cultures and they develop what they call a clean line of cells. From there, they put it on uh, scaffolding, which they say is edible, biodegradable, non-harmful. Put it in a media and then um, that promotes growth and then they put it in this bioreactor. So it, it has been described to me as more like brewing a beer. So you mix these cells, you put them on a, you, put, you take the cells, the sterile environment, you feed them the growth medium, and then you grow them on the scaffolding inside of a bioreactor. The, the overview of where we are is that on February 9th, the U.S. Cattlemen's Association filed a petition with the U.S. of 2018, um, filed a petition with the USDA to exclude cell cultured proteins from being labeled as meat or beef. Then in May 14th, the egg appropriations bill included a regulatory section in their bill saying that any of this stuff had to be regulated by the USDA. Then out of the blue on June 15th, the FDA announced that there was going to be a, a well, it wasn't a hearing, a meeting on foods produced using animal cell culture technology. And then um, uh, right around that same time, Aleph Foods Limited, which is an Israeli company, asked the USDA to promote clean meat. Uh, they've been working on this for quite a while, and um, they were compelling the safety advantages of it. You know, I should back up and say the first lab created, I think it was, it was a meatball, was created in 2009. And at that time, it was, they, they created a meatball from cell culture, but it was not very tasty because they didn't include, include any fat. So then they realized that was the beginning of this, this process. And one of the biggest companies here in the United States is, is Memphis Meats. And, and that is headed by Uma Valetti, who is a, was a heart surgeon at the Mayo Clinic. And they were taking heart cells to grow heart tissue, to transplant into patients uh, to, for heart repair. And so he thought, if we can do this with heart tissue, why can't we do this with steak or hamburger and not have to kill an animal? We can just make it in a lab. So that's a kind of interesting background for uh, this process and some of the players involved. Um, on June 27th, the very first congressional briefing took place, and it was on lab proteins hosted by the R&D caucus co-chairs, co-chairs Bill Foster and Barbara Comstock at the time. Then on July 12th, 
the FDA had its meeting on foods producing, produced using animal cell culture technology, after which there was a letter that um, Cattlemen's Association opposes calling it meat, but Memphis Meats joined forces with the North American Meat Institute, and they wrote a letter uh, calling to President Trump, calling for both agencies, the FDA and the USDA, to have regulatory jurisdiction. After that, there was an announcement that the USDA and FDA would have a joint public meeting, which they did on the 23rd and 24th. The use of cell culture technology to develop products derived from livestock and poultry. You'll notice that uh, fish is absent from this, and there's been discussion about the FDA already regulates that, with the exception of catfish. So uh, it, it sort of seems to be left out of the equation. I don't know, Barbara, if you have more information on that, that than I do. Um, and then I guess I'm repeating this LF Foods here, but. <laughs> Uh, that's a mistake, should be out of there. Then on November 16th of last year, the USDA and FDA commissioner issued a joint statement on regulation of, of cell cultures, saying that they would both, after this productive joint public meeting, that they would both regulate. And I'll go into detail on that later. So the July 12th FDA hearing was, you know, it was regarded as a power grab and uh, Commissioner Gottlieb talked about promotion of innovation and protection of customers and saying that the FDA should regulate. They were in the best position to regulate. And he talked about all their experience and they already evaluate microbial algae and fungal cells. And, um, you know, they, they've managing genetically in, managed genetically engineered plants and managed issues on cell culture technology and packaging and processing and all those kinds of things. So initially there was this, this uh, you know, battle between the USDA and FDA. Thankfully, we're not in that, engaged in that anymore. But they were asking, you know, good and relevant questions like, what are the considerations that are specific to this technology? And um, what should we be asking in evaluating this, these foods and how they're produced, their method of manufacture. And then what are the variations in uh, manufacturing methods that are specific to cell culture technology that, that are different from other food manufacturing processes? And what are the substances? And as far as I know, a lot of that is still uh, regarded as trade secret information because as you can imagine with any new product, there's a race to the market first to market wins. And so what are the substances that are going to be used in this process? And what are the considerations? How do we evaluate the safety? And what are the hazards? You know, uh, Barbara will talk more about that, but the sanitation and possibility for contamination. And what does this production process, what's unique about it that requires us to evaluate hazards from a different perspective? So, as I mentioned, the Memphis Meats and NAMI joined forces, and they, in their letter to President Trump, they agreed on the naming convention. There was a big fight about that with, you know, the Good Food Institute, GFI, saying and they've been calling it clean meat for quite a while. Well, you can imagine uh, what regular ranchers think about calling lab-created hamburger clean meat and their meat dirty. Uh, I think you know, legally, just based on other cases, that isn't something that that would that would hold up, in my opinion. So clean meat was not a non-starter, I thought, but they that was something that still persists today, calling it clean meat. But the but NAMI and Memphis Meats agreed on cell-based meat and poultry. That's not where we ended up, but they they were demonstrating agreement uh, between potentially uh, divided industry interests. And they focused on the goal of protecting consumers and at the same time fostering in innovation. And they think that they thought that the agencies should cooperate and the FDA should have pre-market and USDA uh, um, after 
the, the initial valuation by the FDA. And they called for a joint meeting. Interestingly, they called for a joint meeting involving the White House, USDA, FDA, farmers, lab created, lab created meat industry. Nobody thought to invite consumers, which I find quite interesting because we're the ultimate users of the product and we're the ones that need to be kept safe. But then we ended up with this joint hearing and what they did was they divided the USDA and FDA hosted this meeting and divided up into two days and two separate types of topics. The first day was on oversight hazards and controls and the second day was labeling and claims. I, I will say that, that the next speaker, Barbara Kowalczyk, spoke at both this public meeting and the one prior and had some great insight and, and good comments. The groups commenting were consumer advocates, animal advocates, big animal operation advocates, cell culture technology advocates, and then I call it the rationals, the people that are just standing back and saying, wait a minute, what? let's take a look at this, not advocating for a position, but, but asking relevant questions. The current regulatory safety frameworks for foods and products of cell culture technology, USDA and FDA, both have would have some regulatory input in this as it stands now. Um, the potential hazards are covered by everything I think you already know, has the SSOPs, FISMA, you know, all those kinds of things that we have in place. I still question the adequacy of what's in place for this process. Again, you see the same kinds of questions that they were asking for public comment. You know, potent, where are the potential hazards here and what are the differences in these processes? And, you know, is there already an effective application of pre-market programs that ensure the safety of these foods? And what are the other tools that should be used to manage hazards here? And I, I'm posing these questions. These were the questions that were asked, and I'll touch a little bit on some of the comment. I, I can talk on this forever. I see I'm coming up on some time here, time constraints. But, but these are the same kinds of questions your state consumers are going to be wanting to know that, and you want to know, like in regulating what you know, what do we need to look out for? And I'm guessing the comment period was extended to the end of December and that's ended, but I know there are ways to continue to make your your comments. Um, but, you know, the stages of this process include the cell procurement and selection, establishing master cell banks, growing the cells or prolifer proliferation, differentiation, and then you have the additional processing and packaging Added to that is the culture media and the scaffold element production. Now, when you have, uh, I mean, I use cow as an example, but it applies. I mean, we all know how, how cows grow, <laughs> and we have studied that pretty significantly, extensively. So we have pretty good idea about what that process is, but this is a whole um, new thing. And then uh, we're asking about what's the appropriate oversight a lot of the industry people say that, you know, this is a manufacturing process, it's pristine, we don't really need to have a USDA inspector there all the time as long as the process is, you know, the the process is regulated and it's, it's sterile and clean. Um, that's all we need. I don't know about that. Um, but we don't want to duplicate or create more inefficiencies, right? Because the agencies are already strapped uh, for resources. So, we, you know, we don't really, if it's not necessary, you don't want to take up resources to have somebody sitting in a laboratory. Um, consumers don't like this. By and large, a lot, a lot of consumers, they say it's analogous to the GMO industry and they're, they're leery of government approval without having fully vetted the safety of the product and the process. And they find a degrass to be a dis defective process because it's self-policing. There isn't any peer review, and it doesn't provide confidence for customers. Um, 
call, they're calling for a comprehensive and mandatory review, independent and transparent. And new processes need new regulatory, new technolo technological processes need new regulatory processes is the comment. Um, but the, and a single point of entry, that's a comment from industry. Um, and so I don't know different, different perspectives, but uh, I personally, I agree with a, I, the rush to market usually ends up with after the fact trying to fix it is, is terrible. So I think we need to be careful before approval and that's the time to make the changes. And we have to evaluate everything that goes into this process. You know, what are all the chemicals? What are the bioscaffolding? What is, you know, what is the impact on the human system of all those things? You know, every, it's, as with GMOs, it was like, well, it's corn, it's corn, it doesn't matter. Well, hamburger, hamburger. Well, no, it's not. It's an entirely different process. So what is the impact on the, the human system? The American Meat Science Association says, you know, how we don't have enough information here. How is that conversion? How does that take place? What are, you know, is it meat? We we don't know. There's not enough information here to evaluate. We're willing to do it, but we do need more information. Um, and other these are other comments. I listened to the whole two days of of, of commentary and I just excerpted out. It's all on, on YouTube. You can listen to the whole thing if you like. I will, the slides I'm happy to make available or I, I guess um, you guys will make available to anybody that wants them. I certainly have my permission. There's a lot of information in here I don't have time to go through, but I just wanted to highlight more of the interesting comments that what I thought were interesting. Um, so that's what, what we're looking at here. Uh, one comment is, you know, these risks are not hypothetical because the risks are poo-pooed by industry by and large. They say they want safety, but they say, well, it's pretty risk-free. Um, the process does require antibiotics, as I understand it. There could be an allergen risk of new ingredients. No EPA risk assessment of environmental contamination has been done. There was all kinds of information about that it takes Oh, to produce one kilogram, I think I have it in here, but it was like a, a ginormous amount of water to produce just one kilogram of meat. Um, you know, and then here you have your regulatory framework for food labeling. Consumers are really interested in knowing what exactly is in this. They want to know if, if I'm buying hamburger, is this from a regular cow or is this from a lab? And so, should that be on the label? Of course, it seems like it should, but I don't know where we're going to end up. Um, should the source of the animals be considered, and should that be uh, required information? Where are the animal? Are they, you know, animals from Joe's farm in I'm in Minnesota, Stearns County, or are they from a different country? Does it matter? I don't know. And now they're also talking about hybrid products that are cell cultured and traditionally raised and slaughtered meat and poultry products. So mixing them, there's a whole nother thing of how do you deal with that? Um, and again, what other, what other things should we, should we consider? Oh, here it is, 5,000 liters of fluid to produce one to two kilograms of the product and what are the byproducts and where where does that go um nutrition potential what it you know what is it consumer surveys should be labeled meat with an explanation needs to be clearly labeled is the comment on on consumers and i'm sure you'll find that when you talk to people in your um estates Antibiotics should use should be on the label, all these kinds of things. So um, just to wrap up here, a couple more comments, and we're going to take questions at the end. And happy to, to it's a huge topic, a huge topic. So happy to talk through any questions. On November sixteenth, so this is less than a month after the joint meeting, USDA and FDA 
uh, Secretary Purdue and Commissioner Gottlieb issued a joint statement. Extending public comment period through almost the end of the year, they agreed that they should jointly oversee the production. Um, the FDA would oversee cell collection, cell banks, and cell growth and differentiation. And then the process would be transitioned from the FDA to USDA oversight at the cell harvest stage. So then the USDA oversees production and labeling of food products that um, are the result of this cell growth. And in um, they both said that they would jointly said they would leverage their existing experience and um, the FDA already has experience regulating cell culture technology and living biosystems, and the USDA has expertise in regulating livestock and poultry for human consumption. So the bottom line, according to them, is stay out of our business. We know what we're doing, and we're playing nice in the sandbox, and we don't need any more regu regulations or legislation to take care of this. The, there's been some fallout in the states, and as some of you will know, in Missouri was the first to um, do anything. The legislation in Missouri defines meat as any edible portion of livestock or poultry carcass or part thereof, and any um, labeled meat product has to be, that's derived from livestock or poultry has to be labeled that way. So if you don't label cell cultured meat as cell cultured, it's um, up to one year prison and fines of $1,000. I don't know who goes to prison. But other states have followed suit, Nebraska, Tennessee, Virginia, Wyoming, and I believe there are three other states. I think there are, actually I think there are nine total that have moved to define meat as coming from a, an animal that's been slaughtered basically. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, what the interplay is here, and that's where you you will be concerned, like the interplay between states and Fed, and and what can be done here. This is just the beginning, and so again, I think it's really important that we get it right because there are so many applications, and they're talking about hybrid, as I mentioned, and they're, you know, Peter Seal said they're making mouse meat, lab-grown mouse meat for to feed your pet. So I think it's, uh, you know, something we really need to pay attention to, to continue to be educated about. And, um, you know, just be can, because we can create something doesn't mean we should. I think this quote I like, technology is a useful servant, but a dangerous master. So I think we have to be really careful in how we, go about this and I think it's important for everybody to make their concerns heard and make their voices heard and with that I will turn it over I hope I didn't talk too fast but I'll turn it over and um, thank you so much for the opportunity thank you Susan we really appreciate that uh, we will be having a Q&A session on the Q&A at the end of the uh, presentation so uh, at this point in time, I'm going to be introducing Dr. Bob Kowalczyk. Uh, she's assistant professor at The Ohio State University. She holds a BA in uh, mathematics, a, a MA in statistics, and a PhD in environmental health. Uh, she is a recognized expert in food safety with broad experience and training in epidemiology, uh, statistics, informatics, risk analysis, regulatory decision making, and public policy. For nearly 15 years, her efforts have focused on advancing a more systems-based approach to food safety that promotes evidence-based decision making and considers the broader correctness of, correctness of, uh, correctness of human, animal, and environmental health, uh, also known as One Health. Prior to joining um, Ohio State University, uh, she was a senior food safety and public health scientist at RTI International and a research assistant professor in the Department of Food, Bioprocessing, and Nutrition Science 
at North Carolina State University. Uh, with that being said, Barbara, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot, Jim. I'm really excited to be here today and appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone about uh, this this emerging issue. So um, I'm going to talk today, oh, and let me see if I can get this to work. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit more from the uh, risk side of things and how do we manage it. And so, you know, obviously these numbers are a little bit old, but, you know, we know that we have a growing global population and feeding that population is really a challenge. Um, we have to, these are fairly old estimates, but uh, FAO estimated that there's 21 billion food animals raised to feed the world's population and 26 percent of, of land surface is used for grazing and 33 percent of arable land is used to grow feed and of course uh, 70 percent of emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic um, so which creates a huge challenge for us so and you couple that with a changing landscape there's increased uh, demands on our food supply due to biofuels we have greater urbanization and population growth and then, of course, you still have these um, new and emerging zoonotic diseases. Uh, along with that, um, I'm sure you're all aware that antimicrobial resistance or antibiotic resistance has been of increasing concern in um, recent years. And, uh, you know, we're seeing increasing resistance in foodborne pathogens. We're seeing uh, several outbreaks of multi-resistant, uh, multi-drug resistant salmonella. And there are several plans on how to address that. So it's not at all surprising that um, companies are trying to find new solutions on how to feed our growing uh, population in a way that is environmentally sustainable. And, and that is a good thing. And as uh, Susan already discussed, cultured meat is being offered as a potential solution um, to some of the challenges we're facing. Now, importantly, um, the claims that they're, the producers are making about this meat is important uh, to think about because, you know, they're talking about the fact that this reduces the risk of foodborne illness because um, it's a controlled environment, so there's less risk of pathogenic contamination. Um, they're also claiming that these meats are produced with, without or with fewer antibiotics than traditionally produced products. And they're also claiming that there is a lower environmental impact. Um, and that's some of the things I want to talk about today. Um, so in these discussions, and of course, you know, there, as Susan already outlined, there's a lot of discussion around how do we regulate these products and, and, and manage the risks associated with it. But from my perspective, that's our top priority has to be food safety. Um, here you'll see, um, the global burden of disease estimates uh, for foodborne illness that were released um, a few years ago by the World Health Organization. They estimate that one in 10 um, people fall ill annually, resulting in 420,000 deaths, and uh, about a third of those deaths occur in children. And the Im entire impact is 33 million healthy life years lost. So healthy life years lost is when you look at the um, impact uh, of acute illness plus chronic illness of foodborne pathogens. And I will say, by and large, this focuses on microbial foodborne disease. It doesn't really focus as much on uh, uh, foodborne illness um, resulting from uh, exposure to toxins in, in food or chemicals in food. Here in the United States, we have, we, um, have an estimated 48 million illnesses per year, 128,000 hospitalizations, and 3,000 deaths. And this is due to just to microbial foodborne disease. And there's a variety of estimates that look at the cost of these illnesses to our society, with um, one estimate coming in at $78 billion in lost productivity, medical expenses, premature, de premature deaths, and pain and suffering. As an, and as I'm sure you're aware, we have some vulnerable populations when it comes to foodborne disease, children, pregnant and postpartum women, uh, senior citizens, and anyone with a compromised immune system are at higher risk for, for serious illness. Um, and of course, you know, one of the challenges we have in food safety is how do we manage the risks? We, I, I like this graphic because it shows how complex 
our global food supply is. You have food in the salad coming from all over the world. Now imagine that we're going to put uh, cultured meat on top of that salad, you know, just like you would with any other product. And the reality is, is that government and regulators can't be everywhere and do everything um, at one time. There's just not sufficient resources and decisions have to be made on where to allocate resources. And, and that requires understanding what the risks are. Um, and for this reason, and recognizing that we just don't have unlimited resources, there's long been um, a call for risk-based approach to food safety. It's, it's the basis of the Food Safety Modernization Act, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And um, But I thought it would be worth talking about what does a risk-based approach really mean. And th this comes from a National Academy of Science report, which I forgot to put the citation on here. Um, I, that I served on the committee that wrote the report, uh, ensuring food safety, the role of the Food and Drug Administration. And the committee of 13, um, the first thing we grappled with is everyone was talking about how we needed a risk-based approach to food safety, but nobody had really ever defined it. So we defined it to be a system that is proactive and data-driven, grounded in risk analysis, systematic and transparent, ranks risk based on public health impact, prioritizes the allocation of resources to manage risk effectively, and considers other factors in decision-making because we don't make decisions um, as much as scientists would like to purely on science. There's other factors, sociocultural factors that we have to take into account. And importantly, a risk-based system evaluates the efficacy of a risk management on a continuous basis and involves all stakeholders. So if you look at this graphic, you know, what it reminds me of a lot is the plan, do, check, act process that we use at HACCP. You know, you plan through strategic planning, public health risk ranking, then um, you um, do, you gather information, um, you then act by in, um, designing and implementing intervention strategies, and then you check by monitoring and review. So it is very much in line with what we've already been doing in food safety. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what is risk analysis, because that's, that's a primary concern in, or primary foundation in a risk-based food safety system. So risk analysis, the way I look at it, is really about solving problems. Okay, you, you, you see a potential problem, you decide what you're going to do, and then you act on it. And there are three components to risk analysis. There's risk assessment, which is science-based, and there's risk management, which is policy-based, and that's all done within a risk communication framework. And risk analysis is really, um, has been internationally accepted as the best approach to food safety, and it's really based on a systematic approach to evidence-based decision-making. Okay, so in a risk-based food safety system, you would um, estimate what the risks are, and in this graphic you can see there's two different approaches, which I won't go into. There's a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach to estimating risk. But the point is, is that you look at the entire system and you estimate the risk to consumers and you take that in conjunction with stakeholder values and opinions and cost benefit analysis and you use that to inform and the data collected through these processes to inform decision making. And there's a variety of ways you can do that. So how do we assess risk? And this is really, I think, when we talk about cultured meat, um, we need to be thinking about starting at the beginning. How do you assess the risk? So um, what you're really thinking about is what is the pro what, how probable is it that health or environment will suffer from an adverse consequence? So we need to be thinking about what can go wrong, how likely is it to go wrong, and what are the con consequences of, of, of something going wrong? And this whole field of study is, is called risk assessment. I, do, I work in risk assessment and epidemiology. Um, but in risk assessment, the main it, it's how do you quantify and characterize the risks? And you can think about risk as being exposure, so the probability that something's going to happen, um, times effect, which is the severity. So there's always these two dimensions of risk. How likely is the risk to happen and how severe, it, how bad is the risk when it does happen? Okay, so this is a, a this is an example of a classic risk assessment paradigm, and I, I promise I will get to the point here in a few minutes. Um, but 
when you do a risk assessment, you want to go through the process of identifying the hazard, um, and then you want to characterize that hazard. What is the relationship between dose and disease? And then what is the magnitude of exposure um, anticipated? And you use that information to characterize the risk, and then that is fed to your risk managers who are going to develop uh, risk management op options, and they're going to look at those options in, um, in terms of the public health consequences, but also in consideration of economic, social, and political factors. And this is really where um, AFTO and, and the members of AFTO come in. But we need to think first about the risk assessment. So as I said, there's four basic steps in risk assessment. Uh, first one is what hazards, foods, and populations are involved. The second one, what is the chance of exposure? What is the level of exposure? And the third is hazard characterization. What is the human health effect of exposure? And then you bring that all to do a, a complete picture. So when we think about uh, cell-cultured meat, um, what are the risks? And the reality is, is that all food carries risk. I mean, there is no food that it doesn't has zero risk. Um, but it's important that we remember that risk can differ by food. Um, so when we look at the cell cultured meat, what are what are the potential risks? So let's look here at the process for a minute. So, and Susan went over this just a little bit. So the process, you start by extracting tissue from a living animal. You then um, extract the stem cells from that tissue and you add a uh, growth serum to multiply cells. Uh, you then grow those cells on a scaffold. You have to exercise the cells to boost proteins and then you grind them up and add flavor, iron, and vitamins to get your final product. Now, um, I should mention, I am not an expert in, I'm not a laboratorian. I'm not an expert in cell cultured, meat, uh, uh, cell -cultured meats. Um, I hope I'm one of those rationals that Susan <laughs> mentioned. It's just that stepping back and as a scientist and looking at this process, we started to have some concerns because I saw risks that are different from what we typically see in, in food safety. Um, and I was a little concerned about some of the claims that the producers were making, uh, especially since they weren't providing um, transparent evidence on, on those risks. So, so from what I understand, um, you know, one of, there's a couple of new risks, and I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but there's a couple of new risks that we have to think about. First of all, um, one of the claims is, is that they're not using antibiotics. Um, and I, I will tell you, they, are, they do have to use antibiotics in the initial phase of developing the cell line. Um, they also have to, they've also produced this product in an aseptic environment, sterile environment. So we know that in order to have a sterile environment, maybe you're not using antibiotics, but you're probably using antimicrobials or some sort of other chemical. And it's important to remember that antibiotic resistance isn't the only problem we have. It's antimicrobial resistance is a problem. And so, yes, they're not using as much antibiotics as, um, and I don't know if this is true because I haven't seen the evidence, but they may be um, using fewer antibiotics than traditional um, meat and poultry production, but are they using more antimicrobials overall? And that's a question that I had and I wasn't able to get an answer. So there's that concern is how, how, how much antimicrobial is going to be used in this process. The next point is, is with any process, you can have contamination. Um, and of course, if you're looking at processing environment, one of the things that you always start thinking about is Listeria monocytogenes. And so, um, because you can have that growth. And so the other thing I cautioned at the meetings about was the fact that I wouldn't say that just because this is a sterile environment, it's, it, you know, you don't have the risk of foodborne illness. I think that that's not necessarily true. You do have other pathogens that you have to worry about. Are we necessarily worried about 0157H7? Probably not. But that doesn't mean there aren't other pathogens like listeria that may be a potential concern. Okay, so the second, so we have already two concerns here. Uh, what is the risk of microbial contamination in this process and which pathogens do we have to be concerned about? Um, it's probably not what we traditionally think of. And two, what is the antimicrobial resistance risk, not just antibiotic resistance risk? Um, the third piece, uh, the third thing that 
came to my attention is when you add this growth serum to multiply the cells. Right now, um, they've been using animal sera um, and specifically um, fetal bovine serum to grow these cells. Well, there's not a the, the supply chain to to pre, to supply the fetal bovine serum is just not there right now. There's only a few companies that actually produce it. Most of it is used in biomedical research, where it's used in very small quantities. And it, you know, the the industry, the producers of this pro, of cell cultured meats, has already said that they understand that um, fetal bovine serum is not a sustainable source for um, of growth factors for their process. So what are the other choices? And one of the ones that has come up is human growth hormones, right? Um, as a potential as a potential alternative or synthetic growth hormones. Now um, that raises concerns about well, if how, what is the you know this is food, so people are potentially going to consume this product over and over and over again. So while maybe there might only be a small dose, and I have no idea honestly what the dose would be, but what you need to think about what is the health impact of chronic low dose exposure to a synthetic or uh, growth hormone or human growth hormone. Okay, so that's a, the third uh, risk that I see potentially. The fourth one is is over here we have uh, once you get the growth you get them on the scaffolds and there are some questions about how to get these things off the scaffolds, and Susan had already mentioned that, you know, they're supposed to be edible and things like that, but we, there's some unknowns around that. But um, over here, they have to exercise the cells just like you would in an animal, um, except that they're not in an animal. And so largely the way, if my, my understanding is correct, they do this is by running electrical currents through the cells. Now, this causes the cells to um, expand and contract, which creates muscle, but it also stresses the cells in a different way than what they would be stressed in an animal. And from the veterinarians that I, I, I've heard talk about this, is there are often latent viruses in these cells where the virus is not active, but if you put it under a stress condition, the virus may become active. So one of the big questions is, is by stressing these cells in a different way, are we going to be activating latent viruses that may ultimately be um, harmful to human health? And so um, this was just based on my observation uh, and, and concerns over the, um, the meetings and what I've learned so far. So here I'm just going to summarize it. You know, again, what are the potential risks here? Microbial contamination still is a risk, although it might be different than what we traditionally think of in meat and poultry products. Um, antimicrobial resistance is a potential risk because they do have to, this product is produced in a sterile environment, and how are they going to produce that sterile environment? We have lots of unknown questions about the growth factors that they're going to be using to um, grow this meat. And of course, by stressing these cells in new ways, are we going to activate latent viruses? Also, another thing in risk assessment is we have to think back to the exposure assessment. What is the chance and level of exposure? So in food, we all eat multiple times a day. And so um, there are risks that we would accept, say, um, because one of the things that they've, they've compared this to is vaccines. Vaccines are developed in a very similar way. And, um, but if you think about it, you, have, you, you get vaccinated a few times in your life, and the trade-off is between the risk of the vaccine um, and the risk of a very, very serious illness. I mean, you know, polio, diphtheria, lots of these things are not diseases that you want to risk. On the other hand, when you're talking about food, even though it uses a similar technology, you eat food multiple times a day, every day. And so your potentially, and your risk choice is, do I eat this product or do I eat a product that's traditional, produced in a traditional manner? It's a different risk decision and it's a different risk profile because of the potential, the repeated potential exposure. And what is the human health effect of this exposure? And the, these were questions that I was raising at the um, public meeting and there were not good answers to. There's also the consideration of the environmental impact. And we all know all systems have waste, right? 
this is an it, you know this is a new technology it is going to be produced in a different way and i certainly hope we can find ways to produce food more efficiently um, and in a more environmentally friendly way. But we can also use risk analysis to assess these environmental impacts. So some of the potential impacts that came up were water use. Um, you know, we do use a lot of water in food production um, currently, but how does water use um, in, in the production of these products compare? And, and from what I was hearing, it was still a significant amount of water would be needed um, in order to produce just one kilogram of this product. In the antimicrobial use, you have um, biologic waste. Uh, you know, this product is going to be um, developed in a, a bioreactor, and there's going to be lots of media, and there's going to be waste from that product process. And how do we deal with that, and what's the environmental impact of that? And what do you do if you find the product is unsafe? How do we get rid of it? Um, so, you know, we already have that problem when we have unsafe food that's been recalled, but again, um, this may be a different type of safe food safety risk. And so one of the things that I am advocating that the government um, really needs to look at, in addition to the food safety risk assessment, is looking at the environment, assessing the environmental impacts and, and really assessing the costs and benefits to the, of this product, of this type of product over um, traditionally produced meats. And, and honestly, I, as I'll say again, I don't really have a, a stake in this. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can find better ways to produce food that are safe, but food safety is my top priority. So um, just some food for thought as I, I wind up. Um, you know, risk-based food safety systems are data-driven, evidence-informed, and transparent. And the question I have is what is the evidence that cultured meat is safer and more environmentally friendly than traditionally produced meat? And importantly, how do we um, communicate the risk to consumers so that they can make informed decisions? Um, consumers, are, this is gonna be a difficult task. Um, just figuring out what to call this meat, um, this product has been challenging. And just to go back to the second point, um, what is the evidence that cultured meat is safer and more environmentally friendly than traditional meat? Um, you know, I'm a statistician and epidemiologist, and I always come back to what is the null hypothesis? Um, and in this case, do we assume that the, this product is safe until proven unsafe, which is what we typically do with food? Um, which makes me a little nervous because we're putting it at, as as uh, Susan talked about, you know, that rush to market. Let's let's assume it's safe until until it gets out onto the market, and then we find out it's not safe, and that's not really good for American consumers. Or do we take the drug point of view and we assume that it's unsafe until proven safe? And this is actually a a fundamental issue when you look at how it's going to be regulated. So if FDA is regulating this product, if they if it, on the food on the food side of FDA, they make the assumption that food is safe until proven unsafe. On the drug side of FDA, they make the assumption that the drug is unsafe until proven safe. And one one thing that is not clear to me is which hypothesis that uh, is this product going to be um, regulated under. So as I close the the um, I have this quote up here, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Statisticians love this. And I just caution you to keep in mind, just because we haven't seen it, you know, we don't have any evidence that it's unsafe doesn't mean that it is actually safe. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that really the goal here is to have um, a food supply that delivers safe sufficient nutritious food to all, but also at the same time addresses human, animal, and environmental um, health needs, which is also called One Health, and does that in a proactive, preventive, and anticipatory manner. With that, I thank you, and I ask you, uh, um, welcome any questions. Thank you, Barbara. We, um, Amy, if you can turn us on so we um, open up the line so we can take uh, questions. Uh, 
Okay. We are not getting any questions. Uh, again, I would like to thank uh, this time. I would like to take this time to thank both of our presenters today. Uh, this is Brave New World stuff. And um, we all need to think about the points that have been presented today. Uh, if there are no other questions, then um, I'm going to uh, wish everybody a good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jim. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.